All right, so about a year and a half ago, I began to give uh, little astro updates, whatever's hot in the news in astronomy, uh, going um, right before our main presenter. Uh, before our summer break, where we cleaned and fixed things up in July, uh, my ast little astro update was about Mars, and we're coming out of the break back on Mars again. So going to briefly cover what's going on with this uh, liquid water lake found below the ice cap in the southern pole of Mars. So we believe liquid water was abundant on Mars 4.1 to about 3.6 billion years ago. Early on there was probably long-term rain, uh, actually moisture was transported around and uplift happened like we, what we get when we have easterly winds here that created regions where a lot of rain fell for a long time. Uh, later in this early period, uh, water underground kind of built up, something would warm it, it would burst out and you'd have these catastrophic local floods. So sort of big things like that ended uh, with the planet largely drying out. But we have evidence of water like these channels here. A lot of pretty pictures here. So we're going to do pretty pictures for a few minutes. There's a close-up of what certainly could be a, a channel here and some sand dunes on Earth. There's a place where probably there's a longer term water presence. Here you can see some later cratering cuts over earlier channels so you can get ages of uh, geological features on the planet like this. And we see a lot of water in the north and the south polar caps of Mars today along with frozen carbon dioxide. What's that called? Anybody? Dry ice. Dry ice, yep. So you have dry ice and normal water ice. We see evidence of maybe a very thick, briny uh, water that leaks out of the walls of some craters. That's disputed. Some uh, planetary scientists think that these are little landslides instead that are dry. And then with the rovers, we see minerals that uh, probably can only form with water, like these little blueberries. Is there, someone correct me, is this hematite? Is that right? I think that's right. How can we judge the size of those? Those are <laughs> real. like what I find in my field. Yeah, this, yeah. Yeah, these, these, these are about the size of blueberries, they're a little smaller. Yeah, these are, this is a close up from the rovers. We also have, I think this is gypsum. Uh, this is a. Uh, yeah, a, a water is required in the formation of these little guys, too, in, in the, some ancient crack here. So we see lots of evidence of water. And so here's an artist's picture of what some part of Mars might have looked like early on. And looking at cratering and the elevation of the surface of the planet, it's. Uh, you pretty widely believe that early on there was this big northern hemispheric uh, ocean on Mars. So what is this latest discovery? Well, this comes from a European Space Agency mission. This is the Mars Express Orbiter, launched way back in 2003. And the instrument uh, making this discovery is called the Mars Advanced Radar for Subsurface and Ionosphere. Spheric soundings, MARSIS. I think they just string these things together, they get the acronym they want. Um, <laughs> this, this radar can penetrate three kilometers down into the ground. And if you have water in a layer under the ground, you'll get very bright, um, reflect, high reflectivity spots. They would see these once in a while, but not enough to really be confident they were seeing anything more than maybe noise or some other strange artifact in the instrument. And somebody got curious enough to really look into it, and they saw that 
the algorithm on the spacecraft in order to save data transmission bandwidth back to Earth was averaging the data. And depending on how the pass hit this possible lake, underground lake, uh, it would get averaged out, and that's why it would vanish. So they set aside a chunk of memory, send it a little update, just like you get to your Windows. They send an update to the software out to the spacecraft, and 29 passes between 2012 and 2015 saw the bright spots. That's not quite enough to know that there isn't something else geologically interesting going on. So they did their best to estimate the, what's called the permittivity of the reflecting material. This is pretty technical. This is how much energy the material can store in an electric field. And they can get that indirectly using this instrument and it gives them a sort of independent indication that this is a, a real signal. And they've looked at what this instrument uh, would operate on Earth in known uh, subsurface lakes, and it's similar. So it's not a done deal that this is a subsurface liquid uh, lake, but if it is, it's nine degrees off of the southern pole, about one and a half kilometers down below the surface of the ice, and uh, about 20 kilometers wide. It's thought to be very salty, and this could be filled with the percolates that we talked about two months ago that are a great disinfectant or a good thing for killing life. Uh, so these are, this lake would be at dozens of degrees below zero, below freezing Celsius. Um, so it's difficult to imagine that this could be a place we could go find life. Um, and so the search is on to find maybe more tropical or equatorial regions where the temperatures would get above uh, these brutally cold levels. But here's a picture of the South Pole and there's the scan data showing uh, the location of this subsurface lake, maybe. All right, any questions? Do you know high, how high the, the, the camera is from this point? I don't have that number in my head. I, I don't, anybody, I don't know. I don't know what the orbital height. This is an artist's uh, placement of the spacecraft. There's not another camera behind it taking a picture. It'd be a great selfie if you could. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 200 mile long selfie. That's right. It's a big stick. Disney says don't take those. Yes, question. Uh, the nature of that image, it looks like a lot of lines composited together. Is that the 29 Those are the passes, yep. Okay. Different angles depending on how the orbit uh, takes the spacecraft over. And it's pretty narrow scan width, and so many times that it comes uh, through the south polar region, it doesn't get close to this area. So they had to wait years to get those to add up and crisscross. Yeah. Good question. Yes? I was going to say that maybe the satellite is in like low orbit, and if anybody knows how high low orbit is, then maybe that's how high it is. Yeah. Well, Mars. Of course, smaller planet, less gravity, also very thin atmosphere. So you can get pretty close to Mars and be in a stable, pretty long term orbit. So. People say that, um, that humans could actually live on it if we tried. Yeah, we would have to, we couldn't be outside because the, the pressure is similar to going about 10 miles above Mount Everest's peak. So, really, really low pressure. Um, so we, you have to have pressurized suits, and you have to have oxygen. The atmosphere is almost entirely carbon dioxide and some argon. Um, so, yeah, but if we worked at it and we, we built appropriate habitats, yeah, we could. The day is 24 hours and a half long, so you'd have a half hour longer each day to brush teeth and comb hair. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Antarctica. Yeah. So, and have they found any life? Oh, yeah. There? Yeah. So we, it's yeah, it's not the, this extreme, though. It's not that level of salt, and it's not that depth of cold. Yeah. Okay, so it's not that salt. Yeah. No. All right. Thank you very much. We're going to do a switch over now.
you don't have your visuals. No sound? Can you hear me now? Oh, I sound like a radio announcer now. Awesome. All right. <laughs> Turn it on. Put it in my pocket. Um, yeah, so I was, uh, so guess what I saw a lot of when I was out there, when I was out over the ocean? 30,000 feet. Yeah, <laughs> not at night. <laughs> not at night, not, not at night it was pretty black. Went looking down, yeah, I saw a lot of stars, saw a lot of things. So I got really interested in astronomy, which is what brought me to Little Thompson Observatory. How many people have been here before? Yeah, good, good. How many people are under, are under the age of, say, 16? Awesome, good. All right. So that was, that was me, uh, and this was me a little later in front, of a, in front of a jet, and that's my older son, Noah who's now bigger than I am and he's also older than I am. Um, well, he's older than I am, I am now than when I was in that picture. That's what I mean. He's uh, 44 um, next week. Uh, and now what I'm doing is I work at a company that's not far from here called Ball Aerospace. And John works at, uh, at, at the Lockheed Martin in Waterton down uh, I guess west of, west of Denver, uh, and John works on the Orion program. Our business, my business, is primarily antennas, RF systems, and uh, electro-optical systems for tactical platforms, but we also do antennas for spacecraft. So why do people want to go to Mars? It's cold, it's dusty, yeah. Do you want to do this thing? <laughs> exactly. That's a that's that's a perfect that's a perfect answer. answer. That's a perfect, answer. perfect answer. And it was it was succinct and understandable. Um, that's that's exactly right. So, our solar system. Can anybody name all the planets in the solar system? <laughs> Yeah, you stopped at Pluto because you weren't sure. Is it a planet or not? Yeah. No, it's like a planet. Yeah. Yeah, and there's, there's a couple other things out there that are, um, that are uh, Kuiper Belt, which is a bunch of icy, uh, icy objects. Um, but that's right. So those are the planets. And I think this is going. And here, here's Mars, and here's Earth. So Mars is further from the sun than Earth or closer to the sun. There's a, there, you look up here, look up here, there's, there's, a, there's a clue, there's a clue. Yeah, so it's further, right? So that's one of the reasons it's colder. It's smaller, less gravity, and it lost most of its atmosphere, but not all of it. It has a little bit of atmosphere left. Um, and we're real interested in how that works for exactly what, I'm sorry, I've, tell me your name again. 
Katie, what Katie said, because we want to learn more about Earth and the rest of the planets and maybe a little bit more about the universe and how, how things came about. So you can see Mars, hopefully, tonight, you'll be able to see Mars if it's not too, if it's not too uh, hazy. We'll be able to get, see that in the telescope later on. It's in the southern sky. That's Sagittarius. I call it the teapot because it looks like a teapot to me. It's supposed to be an archer with an arrow, but I ain't seeing it. <laughs> and the red planet. Um, John talked a little bit about that and uh, something that's going on in these ice caps. And so what do you notice about this red, this red planet? What are some of the things that you can t tell just by kind of, kind of looking at it? What do you see in this picture? Probably that the big red spot right around there was where a lot of the water Could be, was yeah, from what, what John was saying. Because it looks like the rest of it around it. Is yeah, but we, don't, we can't know that. What can you tell that you can know from this picture? You can speculate about that. You'd have to go and do some more experiments to figure that out. It's red. It's red? Yeah. Yep. They call it the red planet, right? Um, and it's red. Anybody know why it's red? What else is red? What's red down here? Iron. Besides your shirt. Iron. Who said iron? Yeah, iron. Yeah, it's, ru it's, uh, it's rusted iron, which must mean there must, be, must have at one time at least been something else there, or maybe there's still today. What would that be? What do we need to rust? Oxygen, oxygen right? We need oxygen or some, right? Or... Right, yeah, so maybe there's, there, at one time there was some oxygen on there. You can infer that. And what, do you, what else do you see? What else do you see up there on Mars? Yep. Craters. Craters, good, yeah. So we don't have too many craters on Earth, uh, right? So that suggests that there may not be much atmosphere, right, left. Uh, and um, down here it's kind of fuzzy and hazy. Is that a forest fire? Is that the California fire? Probably not. Probably not, right? They don't have any trees. No trees. Yeah, that would. Yeah, that that that's one solution. That I'd have in forest fires. <laughs> Pardon me. Dust. Dust. Yeah, those are huge, big dust dust storms up there. So there must be two things to make a dust storm, right? At least two. Yeah. It, something atmosphere. atmosphere. Yeah. So there's dust. And there's something like air, some atmosphere blowing around up there. Exactly. So there's a lot of things you can tell. Um, there's also some other things. What, there's some, what are these? Yep. Hey, you, you got all the answers. Do you, do you know the name of it? Um, I know that one. I don't remember that one. Ah, yeah, Mount Olympus. Mons yeah, go ahead. We got it. We got it. He already yeah. said, that's okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's as big as three Mount Everest, but I just can't remember where it's Yeah, well, you're pretty, you're pretty close. And, uh, and then just, so you see some mountains. You see some big, deep valleys. This is the biggest mountain that we know about in the solar system. And this is the deepest canyon. This is bigger, way bigger than the Grand Canyon. So there's some pretty extreme features there. Now, why would a mountain get so big on Mars? Well, you're going to give someone else a chance here. Um, a lot of eruptions. A lot of eruptions. That could be one. There's another. Re there's another reason. That's that's one. Pardon me. Um, they, there's less gravity. Yeah, there. less gravity. So things can get bigger, right? Things. There's there's less gravity. So I don't know if I'm going to be around when Katie gets to Mars because <laughs> I think she's going. Um, but I want a t-shirt. I want you to bring me back a t-shirt that says Ski Mars, right? Because <laughs> that's got way more vertical than they have around here, right? Will you bring me that t-shirt? Yeah, you might have trouble finding me here yeah. uh, back then. So, so that's, that's a little bit more about, about Mars. So let's kind of take a look at, I think I can click, I can click this. Oh, yeah, there we go. How do I do that? So there's a little bit of an animation. And you can see the ice cap. You can see Mars rotation. 
And there's the South Pole. And I'll, it seems like an awful lot of craters down that way. Oh, this is even better. Yeah. <laughs> Don't shine it in my own eyes, right? Too many moving parts for me. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's nice. Thank you. All right. How do I stop it? I click. <laughs> oh, I, bla I blank the screen. Wrong button. Yeah, there's, a lot, there's a lot of moving parts. What else does Mars have? Yeah. Yeah, how many, how many moons do you think it has? For, Two, right? Yeah, two moons. They're kind of, you know their names? God of fear and something else. Do oh. you know their names? Phobos and Demos. Wow. <laughs> Here, take my card. <laughs> yeah. That's a, yeah. That's a, <laughs> wow. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's awesome. All right. Yeah, so it's got two moons. What did she say? Oh, she, uh, Demos and Phobos, the two moons, right? She like rattled those off like, like I, could, I, I, know, I can sometimes remember the name of my two dogs. <laughs> so Mars and Earth. So what, do you, what kind of differences do you see between Mars and Earth? Size. Yeah. Yeah, the size, the mass, less gravity. If you had, if you were 100 pounds here, or 40 pounds in the case of Katie, <laughs> you might be, you, right, if you were 100, then it's only 38% of the gravity of Earth. So there's quite a bit less gravitational pull. Yes, sir? Mars has less water. Mars, <laughs> well, yeah, way less water. Maybe, yeah, none, none we can see easily, right? We, you had to go get a, a special radar and you had to process it to be able to see maybe the, uh, the reflections that could possibly be from uh, a, watery, a watery surface. Way less water, so it's not blue, it's not green. Uh, it has some clouds, we got clouds. So there's some things that are, that are similar. We have a nice atmosphere because we have more gravity, it was held on to the atmosphere, less gravity, the atmosphere eventually dissipated. So those are some of, those are some of the differences. Yeah. <clears throat> Do you have a question? Aren't there less clouds? A lot less. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> Mars has about one thirty second the atmosphere, I think, that, that we have here. So routinely, gusts that happen across the surface there can reach hundreds of miles an hour, and you could walk outside, and it would feel like a really gentle breeze. You wouldn't even notice it, whereas here, you'd be flying way across you know, the surface. Right. These structures would be blown down. Because the air is so much thinner. Yes. Or what, not air, it's whatever it is. Carbon what it, it is, it's mostly carbon yeah. dioxide. Yes, sir. That's a great question. Does it have an iron core? I, I believe it does, and it still has a, a partial, partially magnetic core, which helps to hold on to some of the atmosphere. So a compass would work on that, uh, depending on where the magnetic poles were. Okay. Yeah, the rocky planets, uh, maybe except for Mercury, tend to have, have a, a molt, uh, iron core. That's what gives us our, uh, a couple of things. That gives us our magnetic um, uh, magnetic fields, right, the flux, and it also helps, uh, the core also, the molten core also helps with plate te tectonics. Um, so, but Mars has no plate tectonics. This is the only planet, you know what I mean by plate tectonics, where the plates are moving? Yeah, so with that mountains and earthquakes and all that kind of stuff, we still have them. Those are gone from, most, from the other planets. And what about outside beyond Mars, where we have the, what they call the gas giants, or gas, right? Except ones that are frozen, but they're, it, it's gas. Yeah. So, um, why all the interest in Mars? I know. So you can meet Matt Damon, is that why? Yeah. yeah. Um, Matt Damon, did anybody see this movie? Did anybody not see it? All right, who, who didn't see this movie? Yeah. Don't, yeah, you may, yeah. I would recommend to go see it. 
it, it's an awesome it's an awesome movie. I think it's pretty a pretty good. I kind of just ruined the entire basis of the movie with yeah. my last comment. Yeah. So <laughs> apologize for that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you, right, right. You can't get blown. Yeah, yeah, the wind won't. The tank wouldn't really drift too far. In yeah, the wind, so. right. Yeah, the, right. Yeah, there's no no wind. But anyway, Matt Damon had uh, quite a few problems um, go, uh, getting through his time at Mars. As a matter of fact, does anybody know how long it takes a, a regular kind of a current technology spaceship to go to Mars? Five months. Close. Six months six or so. Nine. Yeah, six to nine is a, good, is a good guess. And then, can I just pick any time I want to go? Why not? Yeah, yeah. Sometimes we're 35 million miles apart. Sometimes we're 250 million miles apart. So if you went at the wrong time, you'd have a much longer trip. Um, like 60 months, right? It'd be five years. Um, so that would be a problem. And that's the way, that was the problem that Matt Damon faced. He had to wait on the planet until the planets were lined up so they could get a rocket to relieve, uh, to, to help him get off of the, uh, off the planet. You might, you might see you a lot of rocket launches nowadays, especially since they're so much more accessible online. A lot of rocket launches, including the Parker Solar Probe that just launched, was at, what, 2.30 in the morning or 1.30 in the morning? And that's exactly, we have a very precise window that we have to hit. Otherwise, sometimes we have to wait 24 hours. Uh, Lockheed Martin just had a, a different program. We missed a, a launch window because of a single instrument, and we had to wait two years. So it's uh, if you're the guy who owns that instrument, you're not too. <laughs> that wasn't our instrument, was it? No, it was, no, no. <laughs> it was the first story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> On the other picture where it said Mar Earth versus Mars, mm -hmm. I had a question. How sure. Did the clouds form on Mars if there's no liquid water? There's uh, carbon dioxide in the what little atmosphere they have that would condense out, those would be carbon dioxide, carbon, they might even have carbon dioxide rain I, if it precipitates out. But there's not a lot of it. The whole atmosphere is carbon dioxide. That's a really good question. Yeah, that's another <laughs> really good question. This presentation. We're yeah. sorry, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow, yeah, so that's, that's, that's another re really good one. Yeah. How old did you say you were? 34, and you just graduated from <laughs> nine, and you just, you, you just graduated from, from MIT. From, 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 MI, from MIT, yeah, I got a, I, I got a, I got a PhD in uh, planetary science. Yeah. yeah, I'm just, I'm just a ringer in here. So what is Orion? Well, besides, there's a constellation called Orion, right? It's a constellation. Orion's the hunter, right? It's over there somewhere. They're pointing to it. Yep. Yeah, there. There it is. It's right in there. That's the Orion constellation. So, besides that, um, does this thing look familiar? Yes. Well, yeah, I mean, there's one here. What else does it look like for anybody who's around in like the 60s? <laughs> ah, there's somebody, yeah. That looks just like the Apollo. Yeah, it looks a lot like the Apollo capsule, doesn't it? And there's a reason why it's shaped like that. I presume it's, it's a pretty pretty good pretty good shape for you know bringing it down our strategy uh, compared to other nations is to bring it down through the atmosphere so this blunt uh, uh, part back here is a great big heat shield and uh, you guys went out and saw the the Perseid meteor shower I know we were talking about it those bright objects soaring across the sky a lot of those objects are very small and they heat up immensely and that, that energy from just a tiny particle shooting into our atmosphere was that bright in the sky. Yeah. And this it, is about 15 feet in diameter. So this one is a little bit brighter upon re-entry. Yeah. Uh, and, and here's some, these are actually meteors. These are trails of meteors create, hitting the upper atmosphere, creating, um, you know, creating some electromagnetic disturbance that the antennas outside can pick up. So. Does anyone have a, a guess how fast we come back into the atmosphere? 15,000 miles per hour. That's, uh, I don't know miles per hour actually, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could could be. Yeah, let's just go with what he said. It's, it's a little bit more than that. It's, 
It's what we re-enter and when we gain aerodynamic control of the, the vehicle, we're coming in about 30 times the speed of sound, about Mach 30. Um, bullets are maybe a couple times the speed of sound. Uh, like you're saying, a, a lot of our spacecraft in low Earth orbit, the closer you are to Earth, the faster you have to go to avoid falling into it. And so when you get really close to the Earth, you go really fast. But that, uh, that entire bottom portion there, and the reason we're designed like that, is so that when we come back into the atmosphere, you can kind of feel it when your hand goes out the window. That's the friction of the air against your skin. Now think of it 30 times the speed of sound. Your hand probably wouldn't be there. No, but, no, uh, it'd burn <laughs> off. Yeah. Sir. So what material is that heat shield made of? It's like carpet phenolic. It's similar in technology to what we used on the space shuttle for tiles. Uh, we originally, you guys have heard of the EFT-1 flight, we're using a single piece carbon phenolic, which was uh, the largest ever created, but since that flight we've gone back to the, our heritage, which is like space shuttle tiles that we assembled together. So, this, could, this is a comparison of the uh, current Orion design to the Apollo design because somebody observed that they're very similar and they are very similar. This looks a little scaled up. One reason is uh, it's going to go on longer deep space missions. It only takes about three or four days to get to the moon um, and it's going to be six months to get to Mars, maybe longer depending on exactly what the mission, how the mission profile. And, uh, and there's going to be, uh, instead of a crew of three, um, Houston, we have a problem. Remember that movie, Crew of Three? This is going to have a crew of four. So it's a little bit bigger, a little bit bigger, a little more massive. It needs a little more juice. We'll talk about that in a minute. The Orion Oops. can also do uh, 21 days to 28 days just by itself, independent of any other support from the ISS or mating with other habitats. Uh, it'd be a real uncomfortable road trip, I personally think, but um, uh, it can do that independently of just the resources it brings up and brings back down. So there's a lot of testing going on, right? Uh, testing with the, the module, it's already flown uh, once. It didn't have people on it. It was hard to find. We didn't, we didn't know that Katie was around. She probably would have volunteered to fly. The module, they're sending to the sun. Yeah, that's the Parker Solar Pro. And what's the speed of that? I, that's a great question. I don't know. That one is, uses similar technology, though, uh, with a, a massive heat shield off the front to protect all of the sensitive instruments behind it. I'm wondering if that thing is as, fa as fast as I heard it would, like 400,000 miles an hour. Why can't they do the same thing going to Mars? Uh, because as you go closer, it's kind of like jumping off of a building. As you go closer and closer to the source of gravity, in this case being the sun, we pick up our speed uh, just by getting closer to the sun. Uh, if we were to try and do that with uh, a human capsule, kind of like coming back into the atmosphere, we would just burn up. Uh, there, that Parker Solar Probe is going to be incredibly hot, and I don't believe it comes back. Yeah, that bad boy's not coming believe, back here. Yeah. I believe that thing goes pretty darn close yeah, to the sun and then turns into tiny little particles. I'm going to watch it splash. Um, so this is kind of this is some of the testing they're doing. Uh, what do you think the uh, uh, what do you think they're testing here? Spacesuits, spacesuits, right? So these are the suits they're testing. Make sure everything's functioning. This isn't the actual capsule. It's just a room where they're testing them. Make sure everything's working right. So there's all kinds of tests. And uh, I'm gonna. There was the flight test number one, and I got some uh, a little bit of some. I think some. A video here to go show this. This was in December of 2014. 45. That's a Delta IV rocket. Is that our heaviest lift? 
currently uh, the Delta IV rockets, the heaviest operational lift uh, actually Go Delta. designed oh, and built by ULA, which is based out of the South End. No, 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 no. Not designed by ULA. T-minus 20 seconds. <laughs> Inherited. 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 Broken Where's that launching from? This one launched from the Cape yeah, I'm pretty sure this was the tape. Four, three, two, one. And liftoff at dawn. The dawn of the Orion and a new era of American space exploration. So listen for a few seconds as the rocket accelerates. It's accelerating. Doesn't look like it's going very fast. Thirteen hundred and twenty-one feet per second. That's faster than the speed of sound in in about thirty seconds, twenty-five seconds. Thirteen hundred feet per second. Pardon me. So thirteen hundred twenty-one feet per second, and um, and uh, so it's already going that faster than the speed of sound. That means the, uh, the, it's experiencing a little more than two G's, between two and three G's of, of force. And it's going to be sustained for, for quite a while. Anybody felt two or three G's? Where did you, where'd you feel it? F-16? I used to fly a small plane. Okay. You shouldn't be doing two or three G's in a small plane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was a plane specifically designed for Okay, for aerobatics. Okay. Yeah, I was going to say, if I was a Cessna 150, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would have, have been an exciting flight. All right, so that's what's going on. Uh, are we, yeah, and then uh, the, the Navy uh, retrieved the capsule. That's our strategy. Yes, sir? If that exceeded the speed of sound during that, why did we not hear a sonic boom? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know that. I uh, couldn't possibly hear it over the sound of the engine. The engines are so loud and intense in that situation. It's a great question. A sonic boom is barely even a blip on the radar. You can actually, if you wash launches that, that take off, every single launch that takes off and goes to an orbital uh, plane actually does break the speed of sound. And you can see it right at the tip of the vehicle, but you never hear them because the, the rocket motors are so loud. And sometimes you can see it in the rocket exhaust. When the rocket exhaust expands and it gets the, this diamond pattern in it, that's, that's a, a supersonic um, effect. So the Navy, Navy picked it up, just like in the, back in the days when uh, the ships would go out there. You can actually see the land here, where, you know, close to where it landed. Picked it up, retrieved it, brought it back, and uh, took it apart. Um, why do you think they took it apart? That, that's that's one, that would be one reason they're going and examining what. Yeah, go ahead. To, exactly. It was a test flight, right? So they're going to look for uh, how did how did everything work? Uh, they changed the design based on part, maybe uh, in part on the, on the data they got back from the test uh, so they could redesign it and go do test, uh, some additional test flights. And uh, do, this, was, this was back in, uh, anybody see this was on the news? Like three weeks ago, yeah. we had a Made in America week here in the U.S. And uh, during the torrential downpours in, on the East Coast, uh, we actually brought up the Orion crew capsule and placed it on the lawn there. There's a, there's an F-35 around there too, somewhere. Hidden. It, it's it's uh, stealthy. It's a stealth aircraft. Yeah. <laughs> Can't see it. Can't see it. Uh, Can't see it. <laughs> and uh, actually when they pulled that back and when we brought it back down to, we keep everything that's that valuable and really controlled uh, yeah. spaces. So right. when it was out there in the downpour, I think they emptied something like 200 gallons of water out, out of that crew, out of that crew module when yeah. they brought it back. And then they, so. now they know it leaks a little, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> not a problem in Mars, in Mars or space. 
So, and by the way, uh, Lockheed Martin is the, what's called the prime contractor. The prime contractor is the one that has the responsibility to the government for doing the whole project and the whole program and the whole mission. And Lockheed Martin has about a thousand subcontractors. Ball Aerospace, where I work, is one of those thousand subcontractors. And we have, I'm going to show you the, what we do on that in just a minute. So, when the astronauts are on this, what are some of the things they have to do? There's a clue on this chart, <laughs> I think. I put a clue on there. Somebody else has got to get a bookmark. <laughs> yeah, so they got to communicate, right? It has to communicate. What kind of communications does it have to do? Voice. Voice is one, yep. <laughs> data. Yes, data. Did you say data? Oh, oh, you said data. <laughs> <laughs> Sound. Sound, yeah. D voice, data, S systems information. systems information, exactly. So that the scientists and the engineers on the ground know what's going on if everything's operating properly. So this thing's going around, it's spinning in all kinds of directions. Um, and this antenna is what Ball Aerospace provides four of these for each, uh, for the crew module, and two for what's called the service module which is a uh, uh, service module. Yeah. What's the service module do? Similar to the Apollo program, we have uh, the crew module, which is pressurized. It's really hard to make things pressurized in space because the air just wants to escape. And then the service module, which provides propulsion and water, a place for you to store human needs when the, the moment arises during the day, as well as uh, um, other cooling, electricity. It's, it's essentially the backbone, what really allows us to, to go and explore. So that's uh, one, of our, one of our technicians who's, uh, she noticed she's got some, some gloves on. This is an actual unit. It has these red things for handling it because um, and you take them off, it says remove before flight. So don't go, if, when you're out there on the thing, make sure, make sure those bad boys are off of there, right? Or it, they're not going to work. Okay, you're not going. All right. You, I don't know. I, I don't, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I'm not, I don't know. Okay, so you're not going. I'm going to stop Googling you about that. All right. Um, so we communicate with uh, Orion. Um, and uh, we've designed and, and, and built, built these antennas. It looks just like this. This is actually just a mock-up, so I can take it apart. It doesn't, it's not supposed to come apart this easy. You can the mock the whole thing off that stand and hold it up and people Oh, okay. Out. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, and it's lighter than the actual one. So this is what, this is kind of what it looks like. It's, now this is an antenna. If you see an antenna like this. Does that look like an antenna? No. Huh? <laughs> yeah, this is an antenna. It, we didn't build it. I can guarantee you that. This did not come from Ball Aerospace. I don't know where this came from, but it, not Ball Aerospace. If you see a can like this, Ball did make this can. Yeah. As a matter of fact, they make 17 billion of these, not Coke cans, but 17 billion cans a year just de um, in ball, from ball. But this is a, a special kind of an antenna that is for communications. It's called a phased array. Phased array. It's got a number of different elements, and it's for uh, communicating. And we're going to talk a little bit in a minute. I'm not going to. Somebody that actually knows what he's talking about is going to talk about it in a little bit. Uh, he's going to talk a little bit about that phased array. So we'll get to that here in a few minutes. But so these are on. There's four of them on the uh, on the on the crew module and two on the uh, on the service module for communicating. Now think about what's going on. This thing's moving through space at 18,000 miles an hour. It may be going into deep space. It may not be in orbit. Deep space is when it leaves the Earth's gravity and it's going out into orbit towards Mars or the moon. Uh, it's all kinds of different angles um, and it's moving very fast. That's where they're located. Now you can't see them because what kind of stuff is on the outside of this capsule? John mentioned it a little bit. 
Yeah, there's some. Yeah. I heard that. I heard that. Shield, he, there's some heat shielding, right? Because it's going to get hot. Even though this is the main heat shield, it's going to get hot up here. So we don't have these, this antenna exposed to the environment. So it's, bur it's buried so you can't, you can't see them. Which is unfortunate because we should put the ball logo on them. Um, <laughs> let's see. Yes, they can, and yes, they did, because those have been tested. That's how, now, we, that's how we get a lot of our communication for crew voice to make sure that the crew is okay and that the system is still operating upon reentry. And then we have, they provide a, some amount of location data, I believe, when we're high up in the atmosphere, and then as we get lower to the surface, we switch over to some GPS antennas that we have on board. Now I'm going to tell you how phased array antennas work because um, this is a phased array and we're talking to certain kinds of other satellites. Sometimes you've got to communicate through a relay because I'm not always over Houston when I'm wherever I'm going so I can't necessarily talk directly to the ground, the ground control people. So I might have other satellites in different parts. Uh, they could be this way, I could be that way. So it's very difficult, and what you need is a phased array. And this is Dr. Mark Hickel from Purdue University, who's going to talk, maybe. Mark's going to talk, right? One more time. Hit it again. Hi, I'm Mark Hickel from Purdue University. I just said I'm that. Professor Dimitri Perlouz's research group. And today I'm going to show you a little bit about how phased array antennas work. Now, throughout this discussion, as I'm talking about electromagnetic waves, I'm going to draw some analogies between those waves and ripples in a pond using some slow motion videos I've made of water waves. Because since those two types of waves obey almost exactly the same mathematical equations, we can use this as a powerful tool to visualize how electromagnetic waves work since we can't actually see them. So, most types of antennas transmit about the same amount of power in all directions. Kind of like a light bulb. If you look at a bare light bulb from any direction, it has the same brightness. You can also see from this video, the single stream of water droplets produces a circular, uniform wave in all directions. But sometimes that's not what we want. Sometimes we want something more like a laser pointer, or an antenna that has a very narrow beam of electromagnetic waves that we can point in any direction. An example of this is in radar systems, they send out an electromagnetic wave, and they listen for that wave to bounce off of an object and return to the radar. They can use this to determine the distance to the object. But if they send the same amount of electromagnetic waves in all directions, then they can't tell if they're detecting a plane coming in for landing or just an office building down the street. And that clearly defeats the purpose of the radar. So in this case, what we want instead is an antenna that has a very narrow beam of waves that it sends out so they can tell the distance to and the precise direction of the object that they're detecting. Now, contrary to what I said earlier, it's actually not difficult to design an antenna that has a narrow beam. It turns out that the bigger you make your antenna, the narrower its beam is. An example of this could be the big satellite and TV antennas that your parents had back in the day. But the problem with these is that they're big and heavy, so if you want to turn it to point it in a different direction, it's difficult to do and it's slow. So we need something better than this, and that's where phased array antennas come into play. So a phased array of antennas is essentially a group of antennas, which could be our small light bulb-like antennas, that are placed next to each other, either in a rectangular grid, or in the simplest case, just one line. Each of these antennas sends out the same signal, and we notice a very interesting result. And that is that as the sinusoidal waves that the antennas send out travel outwards, they constructively and destructively interfere with each other, so that if we designed our array correctly, they all add together into a narrow beam in one specific direction, but they cancel each other out in all other directions. We can then look at this array as just a single composite antenna, which has a very narrow beam, which is exactly what we said that we wanted. We can also see this in this video. Here we have two streams of water droplets representing two antennas. We see that the waves they send out cause patterns of interference, forming a main beam perpendicular to the drops and canceling each other out in these other directions. We also see these other beams to the side. These are called side lobes. And although they aren't desirable, they can be suppressed in real systems, and here they're just an artifact of our somewhat limited setup. Now, in most practical systems, you'll have dozens, maybe even hundreds of antennas, which allow the beam to get narrower and narrower, and more closely approximate that laser pointer-like antenna that we talked about. Now, you might wonder what we've gained, since we just traded a big antenna for a bunch of small antennas, which probably add up to the same size. 
Well, the answer lies in how easy it is to change the direction of the phased array antenna. So we saw before that if we send out the exact same signal from each of the antennas, that they add together to form a narrow beam that's perpendicular to the antennas. But it turns out that if we add a slight time delay to each of the signals that we send out from each antenna, that that direction in which they add together into that narrow beam changes. And that new direction depends on how much time delay we add to each of the signals. And time delay is really easy to do in digital processing. Says him. Perfect, because now we have an antenna that has a narrow beam, and we can steer that beam back and forth just with a little bit of digital processing, which is very fast. And we don't even have to worry about moving this big, heavy antenna back and forth. Now, we can see this effect in our video. Um, here, if we actually change the timing of the drops a little bit so they don't hit the water at exactly the same time, then that changes the direction of that main beam. We can see here that as we change the timing, we can actually steer that beam back and forth, just like in a phased array. So that's just a really high-level overview of how phased array antennas work. I hope it helped give you an understanding and that it helped you visualize how electromagnetic waves interact with each other. Thanks for watching. Okay, so that, that was Dr. Hickel, that's what that says. All right, so um, the, this is the Orion vehicle with the service module and internet, so it's gonna communicate with the International Space Station, which might be in one direction, and what's called the tracking, uh, tracking uh, and data relay satellite, and this is the thing that's gonna relay it back down to Houston or wherever it is they're listening. There's, they actually have some stations deep, what's called deep space stations around the, around the Earth. Um, and uh, in order to do that, uh, they've selected a phased array rather than having a bunch of big dishes that they have to put on the outside of the module that are going to be a lot heavier and uh, hard to control. And can you imagine having this thing sticking out of the thing when it's coming back through the, uh, you know, at Mach 30? Um, that's not going to work. And this is, pardon me? A little stubby, that'd be a melted blah. Uh, the other thing is, that this, this is more like that light bulb. So this is putting that energy out in all directions. What you can do is with the same amount of energy, I can concentrate it in one direction, which is how I can burn through, burn through some of the, um, the, the you know, the uh, 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 plasmas and stuff that occur as it's re-entering the atmosphere. Uh, and there is what's called a deep space network. Now I think that these are, you can, Tell me if I'm, I think these are like 85 meter dishes. Yeah. That's what it said on, Wiki, that's what it said on Wikipedia. It's got to be right because I got it from the internet. Uh, hey. Uh, yeah, so then there's three of these, there's, there's these three antennas that are looking in different directions. And then there's three of these stations uh, about 120 degrees apart around the world. In Canberra, Australia, in Madrid, Spain, and in Southern, uh, Southern California. Uh, and that's the that's the and that's what NASA uses to monitor these satellites and and these spacecraft that are going into deep space, like the New Horizons mission, the New Horizons that went out past Pluto. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, real very very um, uh, weak signals, and they take a long time. So, there was the test. They're testing the spacesuits. They're uh, we're building up parts for the next vehicle. We just delivered a bunch of them to Lockheed Martin um, a few weeks ago, a bunch of these. Um, so what's going to happen? So NASA actually has uh, a campaign. The first thing to do is uh, uh, get, get things in uh, low Earth orbit, commercial international partnerships, test out all of the systems and test out how all this is going to work. Uh, and then, I didn't know, I never heard of this word. I thought it was, I was arguing, I thought it was a misspelling. But there is actually something called uh, cislunar, which is between Earth and the moon, right? So I learned a new word tonight. <laughs> and um, uh, there's a few, yeah, oh, yeah, wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. The planetary scientists, the real, real space scientists, and, and one, of the, one of the rocket scientists that works, that's a, another rocket scientist that works here, um, knew that word. I learned it tonight, and I'm not younger than 16. Uh, so that's the next, that'll be the next piece, phase of this. And then 
uh, to build a deep space gateway, uh, use the moon as a place to uh, do experiments and use the lunar orbit as a place to uh, uh, to use as a departure base to go to perhaps to go to Mars and then eventually uh, orbital missions around Mars back and forth and finally landing people scientists engineers on Mars uh, Katie says she ain't going so you want to can we got to cancel that mission you tell me that's this one of the one of the interesting things about this build-up and this has been something that's been very directed is we were kind of showing the scale earlier of of the Orion capsule you know if the Orion if we sat it down on the ground definitely wouldn't be this spacious you could probably fit it inside of this room um, a realistic mission to Mars would take us, we were talking nine months there. You have to wait for the orbits to appropriately align and nine months back. So we're really talking almost a three year mission. Could you guys imagine being in a quarter of the size of this room for three years with uh, three of your closest friends? <laughs> coworkers, actually, sorry. Coworkers, yeah, coworkers yeah. colleagues, yeah. So At least for the first part of the mission. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, uh, the main point that they're trying to do there is that they're trying to build up. We know it's not just going to be the Orion. It's going to be the Orion already is a project that includes all 50 states. We build something in every single state and 16 different countries around the world. So we know this is going to be a really big effort, and we're going to need to create an even bigger, almost like a mini international space station in order to safely transport people to and back from, uh, which some people usually forget about. Yeah, oh yeah, Mars. there's that, yeah, right, yeah. yeah. We actually yeah. like our humans, we want them back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 right. How many people are at this space station at a time? That's a good question. We usually keep six on board. That's a good question. Sometimes there can be a couple extra or a couple fewer, depending on when people arrive. How about the space station, you want to go to the space station? Yeah. All right, well, it's like a roller coaster. You got time to make up your mind. Yeah. So the other thing is the space launch system, that Delta IV rocket is not going to hack it for those deep space missions, right? It needs a lot more thrust, right? We have to get out of the, uh, they have to get out of the Earth's, Earth's orbit with enough velocity to send something all the way to 35 million miles or whatever it's going to be uh, to Mars. So that's another thing that needs to be developed. It's in development now, uh, not right, not quite there yet. Uh, yeah, similar to that EFT-1, Exploration Flight Test 1, uh, astronauts don't like jumping on the very first rocket that we produce for some reason. <laughs> uh, and so we have a ex uh, uh, an Exploration Mission 1, which will be the full flight vehicle. Everything is the same way that it would put humans. And we'll launch that. We'll do a full test of our systems all the way through the end of its planned life and then bring it back in just like it were to have humans on it. Uh, and that is essentially one more test that we do before we get to put humans on board and start sending people back actually further beyond the, the dark side of the moon than, than we've gone so far. Yeah, and, and realistically, who wouldn't want to sit on a million pounds of hydrazine when they light it on fire, right? <laughs> Uh, we have actual, we use dummies, it's a, kind of like a mass sim, but you know, we instrument them, like car crash dummies. Car, car crash, yeah. yeah, yeah, or, sir, ma'am. I, I just want to share with you, a couple of years ago, I was at a presentation here, and a little girl asked, well, what do you have to do to be uh, an astronaut? And the answer was, you have to be really, really nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's. That's one thing. That's that, that's um, that's uh, necessary, but not sufficient. Right. The, uh, yeah, the big the big thing with the astronauts, big focus. Mm. I think everyone looks at 30 years ago. If you weren't a Navy pilot, you or Air Force or test Air pilot. Force. Sorry, sorry. I was a Navy pilot, so okay. yeah. I, I agree with you, John Glenn and those guys. Then you didn't get to be an astronaut. 
that's just uh, you know they were they were flying the space shuttle, commanding the space shuttle, and as we've seen that shift to more automated systems uh, and less reliance on the ability to fly aircraft to re-enter, and it was also the physical fitness portion of it early in our early in our space program when we were launching humans, uh, we essentially just took intercontinental ballistic missiles and said this should work and put humans on top of it. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. <laughs> Launched them, see, yeah, see it at two orbits. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, the EM mission one. Question. Yes. Where will the launch toward Mars be from? From Earth or from the moon? We would launch from here. Uh, we would launch from here, and then in that cis lunar space, um, once we got away from, once we exceeded the escape velocity essentially escaped the gravity of Earth, we would have a cislunar habitat. So that's that buildup that we were talking about around the moon. And then from there, the propulsion would all be contained inside of like a mini, if you, if you saw, um, what was that, the, the Martian? If you saw the Martian, it's kind of like a habitat like that, minus the gravity, because that's way harder than they know. <laughs> Yeah, so good question, and it's a lead into the next little video we have here. This isn't an actual launch. This is a really good <laughs> animation of what that mission, exploration mission might look like. It even sounds real. That's that space launch system. No people on board yet. No people on board yet. That was the escape, the escape module, and off it goes. Who would make noise at that? Yeah. Well, it would, it would still make noise, but you couldn't hear it. Unless you were in the capsule. In the capsule, you can hear it. They put a microphone in the capsule. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and those are the solar the solar arrays to power it, and there goes the whatever that the, ICPS, the, I, yeah, ICPS. The interim cryogenic propulsion propulsion state. system. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah, there it goes. And here we go. It's headed off, headed off to the moon. Correct. Well, as the air gets thinner and thinner, the speed of sound goes lower and lower and lower. And there's a place called Max Q, where you're getting the maximum dynamic pressure on on the vehicle. Um, and it would be very, it would be, it would be gradual. You'll be going so much faster than sound at the at, up here because the speed of sound is is uh, slower, slower till it's zero in space that you, 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 if you were somehow instrumented and you wanted to hear it, you, there'd be a place where you wouldn't be able to, where you would just not be able to hear it. It would be just so low. Fade it would away. fade away. Just like when, yeah, just like you got too far away from the 287, you can't hear the cars anymore. Yes, ma'am. In Yeah, they so come out. Mm -hmm. Every parachute that we use has a lot of different purposes. Uh, I think there are 27 that we use upon re-entry. Uh, when you're considering we're starting at orbital speeds coming back from Mars, we re-enter. We can only slow down, or we only want to slow down so much by aerodynamics. And then at a certain point, we need to start really slowing down. And those are usually what are called drogue shoots. So those are just the really small shoots that stabilize us, that hang out, but they're really small. And then in order for us to pop off covers and things like that, we don't just blow them off. We actually use parachutes to carry them away. And then once we get really close towards the bottom, we have our main shoots, which you saw started really small, something called reefing. And then um, we expand them until we're going slow enough that it's only a kind of uncomfortable landing in the water. Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, it's only a mild crash. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Sir. That's a good, that's a good, uh, what kind of uh, engines? That'd be really cool if we did, but they, uh, <laughs> no, a really great question. Um, but we, because it's a really heavy spacecraft, 15,000 pounds, um, it, ion engines currently don't have enough thrust to do what we need them to do. Ion engines currently are mainly used for station keeping is what we call it. Um, there's perturbations in orbits of spacecraft, you know, just slight as you're orbiting around the Earth. And so they're better for applications like that that are very long term and short. Uh, but we use just conventional, um, both like liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen, as well as things like hydrazine, which are, you can essentially just heat up hydrazine by itself and it acts as a propellant, no combustion or anything. Very good. So. We saw there was the test flight one that's already been done. Um, there's going to be a test flight two with no astronauts. Then there's the exploration mission, which is perhaps a flight, an orbital flight to the moon, maybe? Yeah. I, well, maybe that's just a rumor. It's just lunar. Well, that's what it says. No, it says it right here. <laughs> yes. Currently, what, what exploration mission one is, is it is uh, essentially going to be a trace of the path for EM2. Uh, so we will leave the surface of the Earth, go around Earth a couple of times, make sure everything's okay, do our checkout. Then we will leave and go into cislunar orbit, go around and orbit around the moon, and then we'll actually slingshot far beyond the moon, and then come back and, and swing back into the Earth for recovery. So there, there's only one Orion capsule, and they're using that for all the missions? We build several Orion capsules. Currently, we build one for each mission. Okay. Um, reuse is definitely something in the, in our, on our radar, especially with how much it's become the flavor of the industry recently. So we do reuse a lot of individual components, but the main spacecraft itself, we build a new one. And is that being constructed at Lockheed Martin here? Or? It's built all over the country, okay. and it's assembled all over the country. Um, depending on which portion we're talking about, it's manufactured down in Louisiana, down in, uh, down at Kennedy itself, or across the nation. But aren't they finishing the final construction at Kennedy? Yes, they do. They do the, the big assembly down at Kennedy where we pull everything together, and that's where we also mate with like the service module, which is currently coming from Europe, and the launch abort system, which is personally my baby, uh, which we deliver from five different locations across the U.S. Is there still talk about taking Orion to like a, a meteor or an asteroid? And do some, there was that yeah, plan. so originally with Constellation and then when it evolved into Orion, it was talking about going to try and capture, we'll send a mission out to capture an asteroid around the moon and then we'll intercept it with humans uh, aboard. That's currently not part of the plan. Yeah, so, the stepping stones. So there were two, a couple test flights EM1, EM2, I think, is slated for the mid, like maybe 2023, and EM2 is going to have astronauts for the first time. So as far as reuse is concerned, I can I can see it now. Um, yeah. So he's going to John's going to be telling me, um, oh well, uh, you can use this baby again. It's only got 300 million miles on it. <laughs> It was only flown once. To a only, to a there's only like 4,000 degrees at the surface. To, to, a, no, no a, deal. to a cushy crash landing in the ocean. So, <laughs> hop on. Mine, mine scratch. Yeah. yeah, the dense. So, uh, that's two. No no I'm sorry, go ahead. Yep. How much does it cost to rebuild an Orion? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I want to say the. Our operating budget from NASA each year is about, I think it's about a, a billion for Orion, the, that portion of the program, and then a billion for the SLS. It's about 10% uh, of the overall NASA budget, um, maybe 15% maybe when you incorporate some of the, the ground usage, and then, uh, but a really small portion of the overall budget. 
<laughs> a fraction of a penny on the dollar. So a lot of plans for the, the exploration missions three and four. They haven't been finalized yet. Um, and those, those ideas and missions are being developed. And missions to Mars. There will be at some time people exploring Mars. And this is just an artist rendering of a, hey, of a couple of astronauts on, uh, on the surface of, of Mars uh, found an old, an old rover. Um, I think we actually have an antenna on that thing. <laughs> um, it's probably still working. We, we used to show a picture actually that had an, an Aussie logo on the front. <laughs> yeah. 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 I think a lot of people know, I think it was Firestone helped us to develop the original uh, tires to go on the, awesome. the moon rover. So there will be missions to Mars. Um, and we've wondered what it was, what it was like. Uh, except for Katie, who knows what it's like. <laughs> and uh, we're going to find out. We are going to find out. Um, so one of the questions is, who will be the first person on Mars? And I can tell you, this is the 2017 class of astronauts. They're going to be uh, ISIS, space station astronauts. None of them are going to go, none of these people are going to go to Mars. The Mars missions, the manned Mars missions, Woman to Mars missions will be in around in the 2030s sometime if everything goes right. Yes. When you look at solar, one of the biggest concerns people always bring up is solar radiation while you're traveling out there. You're out there for three months. What are you going to do about all of that radiation? Um, and we say, easy, we have all this water around us that we need to drink. We'll just surround ourselves in it. One of the best protections from radiation you have. SPS, SPF 50. <laughs> yeah, SPF 50. Yeah. Uh, but uh, when you look at the, the band, we get to kind of a solar minimum in the early, late 2020s, early 2030s. It kind of makes a rip for a really nice period to, to do a Mars mission. So for those of you who are under the under 16 crowd that I was talking to, I know who you, I, I know who you all are. You have a, somebody have a question? Is there a question like that? Ah, oh, okay. So, um, oh, yes, sir. Um, uh, speaking of the solar radiation, during those three months, uh, don't, like, when they're looking at the windows of the Orion spacecraft, are those windows protecting the astronauts from the solar radiation that will, um, the, everything that we put between an astronaut and the radiation helps us. Some things help a little bit more than others. Um, the two things that, that we're kind of looking at are, uh, we have to bring a lot of propellant in order to get out to Mars. And we like to keep that propellant in the, the form of a, of a liquid. And so those liquids like water, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen, are actually usually really good at absorbing or deflecting or whatever they do to protect us from that radiation. And so we'll essentially have our astronauts spend a lot of their time, their sleeping time, inside of that bubble so that there's extra protection. There was a question from Katie. I was going to ask if they, could, like, if they like, could spend some of their time in the three months looking at the window, like searching for incoming asteroids, comets, I'm sure they will have some scientific uh, work to do while they're on there. Otherwise, they would get very bored playing Sudoku. <laughs> for sure. Yes, you're exactly, you're exactly right. Now, what does it take to be an astronaut, for those of you who are 16? And not only a few people are going to get to go, just like only a few people got to go to the moon, but there's going to be thousands and thousands of people that are working to support this mission. That's going to be engineers. Scientists. Anybody have any idea what kind of engineers? Electrical, Electrical engineers. That's, talk to me after. <laughs> yeah, electrical engineers. Yep. Software. Software. Yeah, a lot of software on this thing. 
test engineers, mechanical engineers, structural engineers, chemical engineers. Why chemistry? He just talked about hydrogen, oxygen, hydrazine. Fuel, the propellants, the materials. And we certainly don't just rely on engineers for this team. Right, right. We have a lot of general scientists right. who help us with orbits as well as oh, yeah. picking the best landing right. zone and where to start out, looking at how we protect ourselves from radiation. And then other things like those of us who help us build materials like this to, to advertise and market and do a better job communicating than, than, than we your do. traditional yeah. engineer can yeah. do. Like, like us. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and planetary, planetary science, physicists, uh, cosmologists, all of those disciplines, all of those sciences, and even for people that don't necessarily aren't engineers or scientists, uh, the people I showed you at the very beginning, those technicians, the technicians that built that build this are very, very highly skilled, very highly educated, and know how to know how to build very sensitive systems that have to be lightweight. They have, and guess what? It has to work, right? Uh, the reason we don't let <laughs> There's a reason. Mark's our quality guy. <laughs> yeah. So, so there's all kinds of disciplines. They do well in math. Do well in math. Do well in science. And I hope this is uh, interested. And who's going to be the first one on Mars? Could be you. Could be you. Yes, sir. Are there any controls in place so we don't have metric to U.S. units version? <laughs> <laughs> you had to hit us with that, didn't you? You just had to come in there and come up over and over. <laughs> yeah, I mean, certainly that has been scar tissue that we've lived with forever. We're going to cubits. We carry. <laughs> Let's uh, see. This is one cubit. So, so since it's a. Uh, since it's a NASA mission, NASA runs all of its operations in US, uh, in US units. So everything that we present and all final numbers that we present have to be in US units. Yeah, these are 3D glasses. Can you see the 3D images? It'll take you, it'll take you a second for your eyes to kind of get accustomed to it. So I think what they're. <laughs> when I hear, oh, you're ready? I'm all. Yeah. These these first couple slides here were to really emphasize that. Mars itself is not just a, a static place. You saw avalanches back there. They showed changes over time. We've seen evidence of, of running liquids across the surface. Mars is a really dynamic environment. So the more time we spend not being there and studying it, the more we're potentially missing. And then, that looks 3D. Yeah, I can, that looks 3D from yeah. here. Huh? <laughs> Oh, there you go. Now we're getting. Now we're hitting them. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Perfect. Right on cue. This is a pretty good audience. That looks like a topo map. Yeah, it's a little shape in the middle. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Katie's bringing me a shirt. And that, ladies and gentlemen, concludes our presentation. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Great job. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll be around here for a little while to answer 
questions? Um, so if you I, have any more, you sir. Kind of timed it right. Uh, it's getting, the weather's getting better. It was really kind of. Oh, okay. A bit. All right. The moon was out. Is it still out? The moon is out. The moon is out. Time to see Saturn, Jupiter. Uh, how about Mars? Okay. I just wanted to say real quick, if anybody oh. wants stickers or Orion handouts or anything like that. I, up here for just about I have one other thing I want to say. I would like to point out my colleague at Ball, Denise Henry, who actually did 99.74% of the work <laughs> on that pre presentation. So.